welcome to the Hawaii Book and Music Festival, one of my favorite literary events of the year, uh, partly because we get to all go at least this year and last year in our minds to Honolulu. Um, want to thank right at the top of the hour, Roger Jelinek, the executive director, and Colin Wong, who's behind the scenes here with us on the Zoom, uh, on the webinar for, for hosting it and for their innovations. And this year joining with the University of Hawaii at Manoa and many, many sponsors. I'm thrilled to see all of you here with us. And I, I know that you're spread all across Hawaii and as far away as New Jersey and maybe even farther away, you can let me know in the chat uh, where you're calling in from. I know my mom is here from Mokulei'ia. So welcome all of you. And Lisa and I would love to have this be a conversation among us all. So please feel free to post your questions at any time in the chat. I'll keep my eye on it and I'll integrate your questions and your interests in with mine. Um, I wanna introduce myself. My name is Connie Hale. And although I'm here in Oakland, California now where it's already dark, I was born and I grew up on the North shore of Oahu in the town of Waialua. Um, I've lived mostly in the Bay Area since college though, where I've worked as a journalist and have authored a number of books, especially on the craft of writing and um, interested to talk with Lisa about some of the uh, writing aspects of her novel. Um, I actually started out as a short story writer and today I secretly write a little poetry, but I have never ever attempted a historical novel, which is why I'm flattered to be here with Lisa, but also a bit flummoxed. And um, I might also say fascinated because Lisa has written not just the historical novel we're gonna be talking about today, The Island of Sea Women, but if I have counted right, nine other novels, including The Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane, Snowflower and the Secret Fan, Peony in Love, Shanghai Girls, and Dreams of Joy. She's also the author of On Gold Mountain, a 385 page nonfiction story of four or maybe five generations of her family, depending on how you count generations who descended from two patriarchs uh, who emigrated from China to California in the late 1800s. Lisa also wrote a libretto for the Los Angela, Angeles Opera on the story Old on Gold Mountain. And oh, by the way, she's curated art exhibitions, designed a walking tour of LA's Chinatown and received the Golden Spike Award from the Chinese Historical Association of Southern California. She was named National Woman of the Year by the Organization of Chinese Women, and her books have been published, published in 39 languages. Now do you see why, why I have been flummoxed? Where do we possibly begin? So welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much for joining us. And let's start simple, simply uh, at the beginning with you as a young child in Los Angeles. I wonder if you could take us into your family store for a few moments and tell us how it shaped your identity and how a howly looking Angelino with red hair and freckles came to write so many epic stories about Asian women. Oh, thank you. I will answer that. But first, I just want to say I'm so happy to be here. And I wish we could all be together in person because that would mean that Connie and I would also be <laughs> in Honolulu, which would be a real treat. But <clears throat> I'm, I'm speaking of, Connie's up in Northern California, I'm in Los Angeles, so I guess, you know, we, we almost have the, the baseball um, rivalry going on right here <laughs> in, in this chat. Um, not that I care about baseball, to be honest, <laughs> but I'm aware of it. Anyway, uh, thank you for having me and thank you for that lovely introduction. So um, I lived with my mom when I was growing up. My mom had a very small family, I think about 10 people. When I was a kid, today there are four left. Uh, I'm, my sister and I are two of them, so really a small side, you know, part of the family. But on my father's side of the family here in Los Angeles, I had about 400 relatives. There were about a dozen that looked like me, the majority still full Chinese, and then the spectrum in between. And so when I was a little kid and I looked around me, what I saw were Chinese faces, what I experienced was Chinese culture, Chinese tradition, Chinese language, Chinese food. 
And of course, that's why I write the kinds of books that I do. But you mentioned very specifically the family store. And this was started uh, originally by my great, great grandfather. And he was an herbalist. So it was a little herb shop. And then my grand, great grandfather um, you know, had it as a curio shop. And then finally antiques and that store is still in business today. It's well over, it's I think over 120 years old now. And so when I was a kid, that store was still in Los Angeles, Chinatown. And it was big. I mean, it was a really big building. It was the last remaining building of, of um, an old tourist attraction called China City. And so inside there was this kind of central hallway and along the sides were little rooms that had once been shops in China City and they had kind of Chinese architectural elements and you know when you first walked in the door this was the room for bronzes the art room ceramics um, jewelry textiles but there were also these kind of hidden nooks and crannies that had these old kind of skeletal remains of China City the old China City wishing well the old China City goldfish pond and this was just an incredible Incredible place, you know, filled with, um, you know, everything from sewing needles up to huge temple facades um, that the family had had brought over, you know, over a hundred years. My great grandparents and um, my my grandfather and his sister and two of his brothers were still working there when I was a kid, and so. Um, you know, they'd be working all day. My grandmother and I would go out um, and you know, get dim sum and go to the butcher shop and do all of those kinds of things in Chinatown. And, and, but at the end of the day, uh, they would all gather in what they called the, the back of the store. It was actually right inside the front door. And they would tell these incredible stories about my great grandfather, um, about China, um, and these were stories that just meant so much to me as a child and all that time just spent with them as a little girl. It's interesting to me also that your grandfather was a journalist and you, I believe, started out as a journalist. And my mother as your well. First book. Yeah, and my mom as well. Yeah, and your first, your first book is, is an amazing um, act of nonfiction uh, and a culling of historical material. And I wanna come back, obviously um, all of those skills as a journalist, uh, obviously in reading your book, how those play um, in, 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 in your novels. Um, and so let's talk, I, mean, I wanna just show everyone the beautiful cover of the Island of Sea Women, which we'll be mostly talking about today. Uh, and this is a novel that brings to pulsing, undulating life, the little known world of the diving women of Jeju Island in Korea, which in one of the very first lines in the novel you describe poetically as an island of wind, stones, and women. The book has been called Mesmerizing by Oprah's Magazine, and as someone who spent many years as a child snorkeling and night fishing and mending nets with my uncles and talking story with fishermen, I can attest that the passages in which you take us into that world, the world of the sea and the world of these women di divers, is indeed mem mesmerizing. But I have to say, from page two, I mean, I got right away this kind of poetic sense that you brought to the page, but then immediately on page two, I wrote a note to myself saying, wow, look at this exposition. So immediately you begin to tell the reader all sorts of historical and cultural information. So the entire book is this mix of story and exposition. And I thought, well, let's start with maybe a little bit of exposition then. Maybe you could tell all of us here in the audience how you think of your subjects of this book and some of the most unusual aspects of Hainio culture. Yeah, so, you know, uh, what really inspired me about them uh, from the very beginning was um, their physical courage, um, 
bravery, endurance, and persistence for the people out there who don't know. So on this island, the women, they have you know, for hundreds of years been free divers and they take deep breaths, they dive down about 60 feet, that's deep enough to get the bends. They stay underwater two to four minutes, they harvest seafood and they're the breadwinners in their families and their husbands are the ones who stay home, take care of the kids, do the cooking, take care of the house, take care of the elders. And it used to be as recently as the late 1970s that these women would retire at age 55 if they lived that long. As you know, there are many ways to die under the sea. You know, you can get a, you know, a tool caught in something, you can get your hair caught in rocks, you can get tangled up in kelp, you could be hit by a boat, you could, um, be swept away by an underwater current, you know, sharks in the neighborhood. <laughs> so all these different ways that people can die. So they would retire at age 55 if they lived that long. Today, there are only about 4,000 left and the youngest one is 55. And many of these divers are in their 70s, 80s, 90s. And again, to have been doing that kind of work you know, many of them professionally since they were 15, again, is this kind of physical persistence, endurance, um, and all of that. Now, I will say that over the, you know, the book came out a couple of years ago, and then the paperback came out last March. And I went out on book tour, it was supposed to be a six week long tour. I went to five states in five days, and then the tour was canceled. And what I found um, was over the next few months, as people started reading the paperback and as we were really deep into the pandemic, that, that readers really, and, and myself as well, really shifted how um, I thought and how they thought about these divers, that it shifted away from that physical aspect into a more psychological aspect of, of this, this, again, courage, persistence, endurance, um, bravery. And um, I, you know, they, these women on this island have lived through such unbelievable history, real hardship. And yet they, and in addition to doing this really difficult job, and yet they have this um, ability to continue and to really embrace life. I mean, you know, they're very loud. Their ears have been quite damaged by being under the sea you know, at such a deep level, um, but they love to joke around. They love to tease. They especially love to tease men and they do it in these really loud voices. They're, they're very vibrant. They're very, I guess the word would be alive. You know, this, this just incredible, like I'm here and let's do this, you know, and let's live and let's eat and let's go in the sea. And um, I, I, feel like I needed that over this last year and a half, but I think readers have really responded to that aspect of, of um, their culture as well. Kule asks, what's the name of the island, please? Oh, so Jeju, Jeju. So it's, it's off the tip of South Korea. Mm -hmm. And it is part of South Korea. Yes. Um, and so it's J-E-J-U. And right. then, um, I think uh, Lurleen asks, what gave you entree to these women such that they allowed you into their communities? Did you speak their language? Is it standard Korean or is it a dialect? Which I know from having read the book that it is in fact a dialect. So anyway, how did you get entree? How did you speak to them? Yeah, first, I just want to say that it's more than a, I mean, it's even more than a dialect. I mean, it's considered a dialect, but if, if poor people who are true native Jeju speakers, they don't understand standard South Korean or, you know, Korean. And if you're Korean, you're not going to understand them. Um, it, it has, uh, first of all, a lot of, you know, because it was out there by itself, this island. So there are words from Fiji and Oceania and Russia and China, Japan, but they also developed, you know, a lot of words that were unique to their own culture. And then one other thing that makes the language so different, which is, you know, Korean is a very, is a quite beautiful language and it has 
a, a lot of this, you know, like a lot of vowels. So when you see it written out in English letters or romanization, it's, it's um, you know, a lot of vowels. So it has this quite beautiful sound to it and a lot of um, kind of length to the, to the words. But um, on Jeju, they speak very sharp and short. And that's because they can't let those words get lost on the wind. So even it's spoken very differently. Anyway, that's so. You have to ask that question again because I, I got sidetracked on. No, no, on no. The, that's, the, I think. Um, oh, you. and how did I? How did I come to meet them? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I I made contacts before I went. There were some interviews that were set up in advance, and then once I got there, you know, one person leads you to another, who leads you to another. Um, I did spend a lot of time doing research in the Kenya Museum, and I remember one day just being in the um, gift shop and, you know, picking up books and a CD of Kenya songs and things like that, and the, the cashiers was like, you got, you got to come with me right now, and so we walked through the alleyways, and she just took me that moment to meet a woman diver, and, and that turned out to be this incredible incredible interview so it really was a combination and then again kind of just walking up to people and asking can I interview you so the and then the last part of the question was you know how did I communicate so I had four different translators um, the first one I think of as being kind of like the official translator she mm -hmm. was with me when I interviewed the grand shaman the top woman shaman of the island whose job it is to go to the seaside villages and perform rites and traditions that keep the women safe in the sea. Uh, she was with me at the Oceanographic Institute, um, meeting scientists also, um, what else? Um, well, you know, th those kinds of stuff with the governor of the, of the province. So, you know, that kind of thing. The next one, uh, she was a student at the university there, and she was with me when I when we were interviewing the women on the beach. And this really sweet thing happened over and over again, which was um, there would always come up. I won't say every single time, but we'll say eight out of ten times that there would come a point when the woman, you know, the diver would say to this young girl oh, could you hold your cell phone to my ear? I need to call my son, my grandson, my nephew. You are so pretty and he's looking for a wife. And of course, I, and I took photos of it. I've got them on my website. But, you know, as you know, that's also in that very opening scene. That's how Young Sook gets out of this uncomfortable situation. She says to Claire, you hold your cell phone to my ear. I need to call my nephew. And, you know, he comes to rescue her. And then the third one, she was the first woman girl in her family to be educated. Uh, you know, on, on Jeju, um, girls didn't go to public school until 1978. And even that required fees. So these women started saving up their money to send their daughters and granddaughters to school. And so she was the first one. She's a PhD in English, uh, wrote her dissertation on, of all people, Ezra Pound. Anyway, she took me to meet her mother, and her mother was the daughter of Japanese collaborators. And this was one of the interviews in someone's home, and uh, she was 91, I think, and, you know, strong. I mean, these women are strong. They're in the sea every day. They carry these big nets filled with sea creatures, I mean, physically strong, but 91, you've got to take that into consideration. And so after a couple of hours, I said, you know, are you okay? Do you want to take a break? Oh no, talk, 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 talk. I mean, she just, a couple hours later, are you sure you don't want to take a break? I can come back tomorrow. No, talk, talk, I mean, she just talked for eight hours straight. And so we're getting, the, oh, sorry. Um, um, go ahead, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'll just, just finish and say that um, at the end, you know, I was, pretty tired, but her daughter, who'd been doing the translation, had gotten very pale, was a little shaky. And I asked, are you okay? And she said, you know, I learned more about my mother today than I've known in my entire life. Wow. And so to have been part of that was just this, you know, I'll never forget it. Oh, that is 